the fact that we did, you know, the one album back in the late 80s and people still write you today or speak to you and they're still interested in that thing that you did when you were like, I was 25 or six years old. Yeah, Jesus I mean, and Christ. It was, I mean, and not a lot of thought put into it because it was so fast how it happened. You know, it was a lot of improv and just coming up with things on the spot and then I was right on the road with them. You know, there wasn't any rehearsals or working tunes out. It was yeah. go in, cut all the solos and do some of the rhythms on the album and we were out on tour. Was uh, uh, Darkest Hour, was that completely like improvised? Didn't you like yeah. write that in like a night? Yeah, that was the first thing I was teaching Jay Reynolds. I was He was a buddy who lived in a house that I had lived in in West Hollywood. Uh, I'd given him some gratis lessons at the house and he ended up for one reason or another I think it was because he was their heroin dealer <laughs> <laughs> networking I guess yeah, you networking know? that's how he got the gig and you know he called me why well, we ended up hooking up it's a long mysterious story how we ended up even talking on the phone but he offered me 50 bucks an hour to help figure out Chris Poland's solos, which is no simple task. Probably worth more than 50 bucks an hour now that I think about it. <laughs> well, and to well. help him write solos for what became So Far So Good, So What. And with two weeks to go before they had to fly to UK, I think that Christmas on Earth was the first thing they did with uh, Tessman and Overkill. Was Crow Max on that? But needless to say, when I went in to teach him, I mean, honestly speaking, he was probably like a, he, he played kind of like a f average rhythm guitar player, right? So, and I'd already heard Poland's solos and I, I knew he was never going to do this in his lifetime, yeah. let alone two weeks. So, you know, it was just a matter of you know, a couple of the guys walking through the room during our lessons when I was showing him. And I, I think I wrote Hook and Mouth uh, I started writing that. It was the very first thing. I don't think I had it finished quite yet. But long story short, they kind of saw, walked in, saw him struggling to play that. And they'd like Chuck Bueller and Elfson would walk through maybe the guitar tech and they'd raise an eyebrow and like scurry out of the room. And then I, I was literally like a couple few months away from leaving LA. It wow. just, I was going to try Austin or New York or UK. I didn't know where to go, man. I didn't want to go to Seattle because it's too depressing up there. But yeah, <laughs> I was literally talking to someone on the way home from a rodeo and saying just that. A rodeo? Like, yeah. Like all, everyone in LA is a bunch of posers. They're not in it for the right reasons, you know, because all the musicians I looked up to from, you know, Holsworth to Gary Moore and... Steve Morse and players like this, I wasn't meeting the kind of players that were in their bands that I related like, because I knew all who played with these guys and I was like, I wasn't meeting those kind of players. So I was ready to exit stage left. I got home from the rodeo. My answering machine was blinking and it was a message from Mustaine inviting me down to the, the recording studio to come early. He wanted to talk to me the next day. So... We ended up walking up and down Melrose, and by the time he got back to the studio, that's when he gave me the cassette of Darkest Hour, cutting to your, it was a long build up to your question, <laughs> but hopefully an interesting color commentary. No, it is. It definitely He gave is. me, and it wasn't the whole tune, and there was no vocals, it was literally like maybe, you know, the part right before the solo, maybe when he's, ha ha, bitch, that kind of, maybe yeah. like that far, and like start here, okay, and there. And then the thing cut off and see you tomorrow, which meant he wasn't there in the studio. But I came back tomorrow and I remember the, you know, I walked in the recording studio and Paul Lanny, the engineer, producer, <laughs> co-producer was there. Yeah. The people have read the stories about him. Although he mm -hmm. did a great album next with Enough's Enough called Strength that is a masterpiece. That okay. album is just brilliant. Wow. <laughs> I, I went in the room and Gadget, Elfson, Chuck, Jay Reynolds was there and the mixing board in, in the studio. And I went to the very back of the studio with my back towards everybody, like this far from the back wall. 
and they rolled tape and I just did what you heard. Yeah. And I had, so I had like that night to sketch kind of, and I always tell people that it was a matter of success happens when preparation and luck intersect, right? Yeah. And I happened to have just got out of GIT and my chops were up and I was playing a lot. I remember Gary Moore, Victims of the Future, had just re been released and his tone on that was super heavy and he was doing a lot of killer chops and I was really working with that album. <clears throat> I remember standing out on my balcony, I, my cable would stretch and I was on the second floor, kind of like this in an apartment, yeah. just stand out and just shred looking over the swimming pool. and Wow. So I was ready for the call when the message was beeping, the machine light was blinking. I was ready for the red light in the studio to go on. And yeah. So once I did Darkest Hour, they were all jumping around the room. And so I think I went back the next day and did Hook and Mouth because I was close on that. And then I did that pretty fast. So they probably gave me Liar 502 and I probably took it in the next room for 30 minutes or whatever and played over it and walked in and go okay let's try something so i think i don't know how the other guitarists in megadeth or you know or other guitarists do it but that was the cool thing and i'm really proud that there was like no rehearsals i never heard full songs and you know i was able to kind of improv and lay solos in there that fit yeah and kind of took the band to a different level someone's saying today you know, they felt a lot more classical influence in the solos and that maybe Definitely the Randy Rhodes kind of Van Halen thing.